This episode of Paradigm Profiles is called The Perfect Breeding Ground, The 3000 Boys. There are over 450 active gangs in the city of Los Angeles. Many of these gangs have been in existence for over 50 years. These gangs have a combined membership of over 45,000 individuals. It's also been proven that there are at least 18 gangs within the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. Under Section 186.22 of the California Penal Code, a criminal gang is described as any organization or group of three or more people that one, has a common name or identifying sign or symbol, two, has as one of its primary activities the commission of one of a long list of California criminal offenses, and three, whose members have engaged in a pattern of criminal activity, either alone or together. Sheriff's gangs fit the description. When Lee Baca won a fluke election for Sheriff of Los Angeles County in 1998, there was a cultural shift within the department. Baca's predecessor, Sherman Block, kept up a nonchalant attitude toward deputy gangs, once telling a reporter, flashing a sign. That's meaningless. In fact, I'm sure the gang members out there get a kick out of deputies flashing a sign, having their own gang. But when Baca took over, he elevated prominent Linwood Viking Paul Tanaka to the position of assistant sheriff and later undersheriff, second in command of the entire department. For some, this move signaled approval of deputy gangs and their style of law enforcement. From this position, Tanaka oversaw operation of the county jails and installed several other gang members to high ranking positions in exchange for money and a promise to keep the blue coat of silence. Among them was Charles McDaniel, a sergeant on the 3000 block who admitted under oath that he was inked with the skull associated with the Century Station Regulators. Under the watch of leaders like Tanaka and McDaniel, Men's Central Jail, MCJ, became the birthplace of perhaps the biggest gang within LASD, the 3000 Boys. This is crazy. You wonder how something like this is able to happen within one of the biggest jail operations in the country and how it would be acceptable amongst a law enforcement community that has been plagued by gangs. But it happened, and it continues to happen to this day. When these officers work in these environments, whether it's in the jails or on the streets, and they come into contact with the criminal element, they began to take on this us against them mentality. Us as cops, against them as criminals and gang members, the bad guys. This even included fellow deputies that weren't inked with the 3000 gang. That, coupled with being young and coming straight out of the academy with a strong desire to be accepted by their peers and fellow officers, is the perfect storm for situations like the one we just all witnessed with former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin. Officers become more prone to going along with different forms of police misconduct because they don't want to be looked at as someone who's not down with the program. You would think that the law enforcement community in Los Angeles would have learned something from the whole Rampart scandal, but that's not the case. Instead, history just keeps repeating itself. The movie Training Day, a blistering drama, which still continues to be one of my favorite movies to this day, put that whole culture on center stage and showed the world what really happens and sometimes does happen when rookie officers like Jake Hoyt are trained by more seasoned and sometimes corrupt officers like Alonzo Harris. Planning contraband, falsifying police reports, excessive force, stealing evidence, and murder are all part of the realities that are being perpetrated by a fraction of law enforcement officers that are out there today. The county jails are an ideal breeding ground for gangs. Most deputies are assigned to work in the system straight out of the academy, and most of these new officers are eager to prove themselves. This particular gang, the 3000 boys that's being highlighted in this profile, have been found to have a common tattoo that has typically been found to have been tattooed on the calf depicting the Roman numeral 3000. Deputies earn the ink by beating inmates and filing false reports to cover up the abuse. In fact, inside one of the booths where deputies work in the 3000 block of the jail, one of the walls is plastered with graffiti and derogatory writings that were openly written by the deputies. It looks like any other wall be smeared with graffiti that you would find in some of the more gang infested areas like Compton, Watts, or South Central. 
and the writing is not the prototypical type of writing that you would expect from an educated law enforcement officer. The style and characteristics are synonymous of gang style graffiti. Along with the graffiti in this same booth is a bumper sticker that reads, Don't Feed the Animals. <laughs> Keep in mind that this is an ongoing problem that still continues to exist in the Men's Central Jail today. And the wall of the booth that bears this graffiti is still intact right now. This speaks volumes as to the extent and depth that this problem has become entrenched in. Even despite the scrutiny and coverage that this story has had on MCJ, this is unsettling and should be upsetting to people. Where's the leadership? Where's the administration that has a responsibility to stymie and forestall this type of conduct unbecoming amongst its own officers? Having done time almost all my life, I know that sergeants go through every housing unit in the jails and prisons to sign the books when they make their customary routine rounds. How come they never said anything? How come one of them didn't tell someone to get a paintbrush, some paint, to cover it up and that they didn't want to see it again? These are the questions that people should be asking themselves. Abuse has become normalized on the 3000 floor. It's normalized in almost all jail and prison environments. Even more so in jails or prisons where there's virtually almost no communication or respect between the inmates and the officers. This is what I mean. A lot of times, there's a certain level of communication and respect that goes on between some of the officers and some of the more recognized prison gangs or criminal organizations like the Mexican Mafia, the Nuestra Familia, the Aryan Brotherhood, or the Black Guerrilla Family. They give us a certain amount of latitude and allow us to run our own programs because they understand and respect our politics. In turn, we afford them with this same respect by establishing these environments with the type of regularity that ensures that their units are ran the way that they want them ran. I.e., we do this by making sure that they're not disrespected or that female officers that might come into the unit are not disrespected. That we don't do things to front them off, such as openly drinking or smoking or doing anything else that might cause their superiors to get on them for allowing certain things to happen in their unit. I can go on and on about all the different kinds of expectations that they might require within their unit. But the main thing to understand is that it just basically comes down to showing a mutual level of respect and that this works both ways. They might tell us, look, we know and understand that you guys run your politics a certain way and that sometimes this might require house cleaning, taking out the trash or other things that you guys got to do in order to keep your house the way you want it. It's all good. We're going to allow you guys to operate the way you do and we're not going to run any interference. However, all we ask in return is that you guys run a tight program. Don't front us off, keep your youngsters respectful, etc, etc. That's an example of how a line of communication that we might have with them might go. And they like that. They like MA members, NF members and the like to have a presence in their units because they know what type of program they're going to run. But when there is no lines of communication with them or there's just no understanding, it invites situations like the one that transpired right here on the 3000 floor. The death of Officer Abel Escalante obviously is a factor of why there was no communication or respect between the inmates and the officers. And in situations like this, the officers will usually walk around all wound up like they have something to prove, looking for any reason to either go in their cells and tear up their personal effects or looking for any reason to go hands on. Not because these officers are tough, only because they know that the inmates are in a position where they can't win and that they have the upper hand in these types of environments. So this situation created the perfect storm and these officers definitely had a bone to pick due to the common belief that these guys, the inmates, through association, had something to do with Officer Escalante's murder. The first known incident alleging violence at the hands of the 3000 boys occurred on April 17, 2008. Deputy Scott Erskine, James Crace, Armando Diaz, and Jonathan Perra ordered Belton Boone out of his cell and beat him. Following a lengthy investigation into the 3000 boys, Boone settled his case before trial in 2013 for $950. What a dumbass. In August 2008, Deputy Juan Abel Escalante, who worked at Men's Central Jail, was killed by members of the Avenue Street Gang in a reported case of mistaken identity. Following Escalante's death, deputies at MCJ began beating and threatening to kill incarcerated Latinos after they incorrectly believed that one of them put a hit out on the deputy. 
Some widely believe that the emergence of the 3000 boys actually started after or as a result of Deputy Escalante's murder. Following a severe attack on an incarcerated man, this was the incident I mentioned in the Tuna Real Murder Profile that was allegedly incited by Timothy Weddle McGee. Other deputies who were not involved with the 3000 boys stated that after Deputy Escalante was killed, the 3000 boys formed and declared war against the inmates openly saying, fuck these motherfuckers. They killed Abel, so we're gonna stomp out every one of these motherfuckers that call themselves gang members. Following a severe attack on an incarcerated man, inmates refused to leave their cells. Body camera footage by ABC News showed Lieutenant Christopher Blasnick, a supervisor at the jail, briefing a group of deputies including Justin Bravo, Enrique Cano, Alejandro Hernandez Castanon, Ivan Delatore, Herman Delgado, Jay Dumoy, Arthur Diaz Jr., Adolf Esquita, Michael Frazier, Antonio Galindo, Armando Gonzalez, Nicholas Graham, Brendan Jackson, Jay Hill, Mario Juarez, R. Len Garcia, M. Lockhart, John McNichols, Jose Mendoza, Anthony Montez, Matthew Watney, Blake Orlandos, R. Patterson, Jason Puga, Aaron Rivera, G. Rodriguez, Joseph Sanford, Matthew Tomas, Hector Vasquez, Kelly Washington, and Sergeant Mitchell Gratton before they unleashed a merciless six-hour attack on the incarcerated inmates. These motherfuckers had a squad. Heriberto Rodriguez lay on the floor of his cell in the 3300 module covering himself with the mattress, not responding to deputy commands. According to the complaint, several deputies fired projectiles at his leg, then entered the cell and kicked him as he lay on the floor. One deputy pulled the shirt around Rodriguez's neck and choked him until he was unconscious. Choke that motherfucker out, man. Rodriguez was shocked back into consciousness with a taser used on his testicles. <laughs> That's not good. Armpits, back, buttocks, and back of his knees until its charge extinguished. One deputy applied his knee to Rodriguez's right elbow in what Rodriguez believed was an attempt to break it. Another clubbed him in the back of the head with a flashlight. Rodriguez was left with a tablespoon sized fracture to his skull. Carlos Flores was incarcerated in cell 4 of a roll when a group of deputies approached and fired rubber bullets. He collapsed after impact, but the two deputies who entered the cell picked him up. They pinned his arms to his sides as others took turns beating him in the head with flashlights till he lost consciousness again. Flores was also brought back with the shock of a taser. The deputies beat him until he lost consciousness again. Body camera footage of the extraction shows Captain Daniel Cruz, the commanding officer of MCJ, looking on as Flores is dragged through the halls of the jail. Flores' next memory is waking up in an emergency room. Following the attack, he suffered multiple fractures to his right eye socket, requiring the placement of a metal plate, along with a fractured sinus bone and persistent seizures. Across the row, deputies doused Eric Nunez with pepper spray and hit him with what he believes to be 40 millimeter less than lethal rounds and a stinger grenade. Several deputies entered his cell, beat his upper body and shot a taser on his legs until he lost consciousness. In cell 12, Juan Carlos Sanchez was also hit with less than lethal rounds and beaten in the head with flashlights by deputies. As deputies dragged Sanchez through the jail, he lost consciousness three times once in his cell, once just outside of it, and again in the dining hall. Just down the hall, deputies beat Juan Trinidad, leaving him with two fractured ankles and a fractured hand. In total, 19 people went to the hospital with broken bones as a result of the extraction. James Muller, who represented victims of the Linwood Vikings, as well as the men who filed against the county in this incident, says the victims of this attack were targeted because they were charged with serious crimes. I remember defense attorneys saying, oh, nobody's gonna care about these guys. The feeling of the deputies and the supervisors is, oh yeah, we're going to beat the shit out of these guys. We're gonna break their bones. We're going to torture them with tasers. How could the captain and lieutenants and sergeants oversee an operation where 19 men had their bones broken and were tortured? How could that happen? The number of people involved shows the sickness of the sheriff's department. Looking back, Bowler says, 
It was the most gratifying case of his career. It's hard to defeat all those lies. They never thought anybody would ever take their case. And if we didn't take their case, that there's no way they could win. Mueller says that deputies staffing the jail were openly hostile to him when he first met with the clients he eventually represented in a civil rights lawsuit against the county regarding the attack. They have some booths that are not private that people can overhear. And so you talk to these guys and you don't have any confidence that what you're saying is confidential to their case. They were happy that someone was listening to them, that there was a chance of getting some justice. Mueller's clients were awarded over $1 million in a jury verdict. Appeals for the case through 2019 ran up a bill of over $7 million to the taxpayers of Los Angeles County. The LASD members involved in the incident faced no repercussions and testified as such under oath and depositions. In fact, no one was ever contacted by internal affairs. Mueller says the inaction signaled to everyone involved that this sort of behavior was upheld by the department. You hear the inmates screaming in agony, sergeants right in front of the cell, looking back a little bit further on the walkway, you've got the lieutenants, they're all there, they know what's going on. Captain Daniel Cruz casually joked with deputies about abusing inmates. The Los Angeles Times reported during a toast at the department's annual Christmas party, Cruz allegedly asked a banquet hall full of deputies, what do I always tell you guys? They replied while laughing, not in the face. Mueller says that a video exists where Cruz encourages LASD members to live in the gray area. Cruz was relieved of duty in 2011 due to his handling of several scandals related to MCJ. He retired in 2013 from the department and appears to still collect a retirement pension. Mueller says Cruz is the person most responsible for brutality at MCJ. Those guys gossip like crazy and that I'm sure sent the message to everybody like, hey, Cruz was the man. Yeah, we were tasing that guy right between their balls and their anus. Yeah, dude, you know, Cruz was there the whole time, man. The spineless lieutenant Christopher Blasnick, captured on film, prepping deputies before they stormed the cells, held several positions in the department following the extraction at MCJ, including captain of Crescentia Valley Station from 2017 to 2019. He was promoted to commander of South Patrol Division by current Sheriff Alex Villanueva in 2019. Mueller describes Blasnik as the most dangerous kind of Nazi, a seemingly reasonable Nazi. Everybody would speak highly of Blasnik because he was this very reasonable heir. But the reality is this guy stood by while people were being tortured and he never broke ranks. In a deposition about the extractions, Blasnik stated that there was no fighting during the incident because deputies immediately took the incarcerated men to the floor. One of many lies this character told. The fact that Blasnik is a commander in the sheriff's department after being involved in that incident is truly shocking, but it's completely expected because he was never disciplined, Mueller says. Blasnik wasn't the only one promoted in the wake of this incident. As of 2019, Matthew Thomas and Matt on Hermes are lieutenants within the LASD. Kelly Washington and Jose Mendoza were sergeants. Blake Orlandos and Jason Puga went on to be involved in the fatal shooting of a 23-year-old Joshua Quintero in 2016, where they were again cleared. Both appear to be serving as deputies as recently as 2020. Deputy Justin Bravo, one of former Sheriff Lee Baca's nephews, went on to be caught by Commander Robert Olmstead looking at inappropriate material on a jail computer. In other words, he was watching Red Tube and got caught stroking one out. <laughs> FBI informant Anthony Brown told the Times that Bravo once smuggled him a cell phone while he was incarcerated. Bravo also appears to be serving as a deputy as recently as 2020. Several other participants in the extraction appear to continue to serve as deputies as recently as 2020, including Clayton Stelter, Frank Quintana, Javier Guzman, Hernan Delgado, Adam Ruiz, Francisco Alonso, Enrique Cano, Alejandro Hernandez Castanon, Ivan De La Torre, Jeffrey Dumoy, Arthur Diaz Jr., Adolf Esquita, Michael Frazier, Antonio Galindo, Armando Gonzalez, Nicholas Graham, Brendan Jackson, Mario Juarez, John McNicholas, Anthony Montez, Matthew Nawatney, Aaron Rivera, Joseph Sanford, and Hector Vasquez. 
Mitchell McGratton appears to still serve as a sergeant as well. I'm sure the 3000 boys were saying, oh, look, Tanaka was a Viking and he's an undersheriff now. So obviously being in the deputy gang is not going to hurt our careers. And you know, maybe we'll be undersheriff, Mueller says. The fact that most, if not all, the officers that were involved in these cell extractions are still employed with the department just proves that these types of scandals have not only become accepted, but they have also become conventionalized and approved. On January 18, 2009, Bobby Willis was moved within MCJ by deputies David Aviles, Carlos Castillo, and Adrian Zaniga. During his transport, Willis complained about the handcuffs hurting his wrist and was told to shut up according to the complaint. Willis told the deputy that he must feel real big and in response, the group of officers started beating him. The deputy sat and stood on his back during the attack, kicking Willis in the head. He was forced to get four stitches in his face. Despite his injuries, Willis lost his case in a jury trial. It's unclear if any of the deputies were disciplined for this incident. 22-year-old John Horton grew up in the Watts neighborhood of Los Angeles. He had a passion for music and was working with his mother, Helen Jones, on her music label. Horton loved his community and his family. Jones said that her son promised her that if he made it big, he would put a youth center in Watts. His dreams were cut short when he reported to Men's Central Jail after he missed a court-ordered appointment with a drug program. He spent his last birthday in solitary confinement. Ten days later, he was found dead. Jail officials told Jones that her son had committed suicide by hanging himself, which she immediately rejected. The community of Watts, nobody bought that, she says. When her son's body arrived at the mortuary, her suspicions were confirmed. To see the scar on his headline, that immediately, you know, you can see that he was beat. I just couldn't believe that they had sent him home like that. The expression on his face, I knew he went through a beating. I could imagine what his last minutes were like. I know he pled for his life. I didn't know if I was going to be sane after I saw him dead. An autopsy report confirmed Jones' suspicions. She said the coroner reported damage to Horton's liver, kidneys, pancreas, spleen, and pelvis. A muscle in his back was lacerated, his nose was broken, and his head had a blood clot in a knot. They hit him in the forehead with a flashlight, which left a print. He was also hit twice in the side of his temple. They hit him in his back with the flashlight right above his tailbone. He has three whacks right there. There was a large pink ring of flesh visible around Horton's wrist, which Jones says were caused by handcuffs. The sheriff's department stated that Horton had died by hanging himself, which was eventually overturned to unknown. Jones filed a civil rights lawsuit against the county in 2010. In court, in court filings, Deputy Christopher Kidder and William Penhollow admit going on a child run for food outside the jail with the blessing of Sergeant Clifford Yates, a self-admitted Linwood Viking. Penhollow also explained that instead of performing his usual rounds, he used a barcode cheat sheet to try to document a security check. They claim that when they returned, Horton was dead from hanging. Penhollow said he did not observe anyone injure Horton at the time. The case settled for $2 million in 2016, which was covered by taxpayers. Penhollow appears to be a deputy as recently as 2020. Yates retired in 2013 and appears to be collecting a pension of over $140,000. He has also written a book, Deputy, where he uses racist, transphobic slurs, describes instructing his subordinates to lie, and admits to committing crimes as well as routinely violating department procedures while on duty. Evans Tut survived a severe molly whopping on July 20, 2009 after complaining about the inhumane conditions in MCJ. Within court documents, other incarcerated inmates describe witnessing deputies Hernan Delgado, David Aviles, David Ortega, Jason Snyder, Rivera, and Thompson calling the Tut a fucking ninja and unleashing a brutal beating on him. They tasered, kicked, and hit a handcuffed Tut with flashlights. His nose was broken in multiple places. His grill was knocked out and bruises covered his dome, legs, and torso. Although Los Angeles District Attorney Steve Cooley filed against the deputies for filing a false report, 19 of the charges were dismissed. 
Tut filed his own federal civil rights lawsuit against the county and was awarded $400,000 of taxpayer money. Shortly following the beating, Deputy David Ortega was arrested at a bar in Fullerton, California after threatening to fight and kill the bouncer. Deputy Ortega allegedly spit on Chris Barton and left him in a pool of blood to die. He pled no contest, served probation, was demoted, and appears to have been working with MCJ as recently as 2020. Do you see a pattern here? Despite the fact that these deputies were all involved in some type of misconduct, the department continued to employ them and they all continued to work there. In another incident, Michael Hogan was incarcerated inside MCJ in October 2009. For three weeks, he was not allowed to shower. When he asked a deputy named Rico why he was not able to do so, the deputy responded, turn around and I'll tell you why. Hogan complied, turned around and was handcuffed. Rico took him to a secluded area and then began beating his ribs and head. <laughs> Hogan balled himself up into a fetal position as deputies David Ortega and Fernando Luviano joined in on the beating. Hogan received eight suture staples in the center of his head and four stitches to the right eyebrow. He also suffered a broken tibia and was transferred to LA County USC Medical Center. Deputy Rico taunted Hogan during the trip saying, bet you won't ask why anymore, will you? Hogan settled a federal civil rights lawsuit against the county for $475,000 with county taxpayers picking up the bill. The 2010 Men's Central Jail Holiday Party was held on December 10th at the Quiet Cannon Restaurant in Montebello. The evening started pleasantly enough. The department instructed several deputies to function as designated so their colleagues could drink. But the festivities ended in chaos when members of the 3000 boys brawled with fellow officers. Deputy Christian Vasquez spent the party drinking 10 beers and a shot of alcohol. Other party goers said he appeared to be intoxicated. Vasquez, who worked in visiting, says he had a conversation with a deputy from the 3000 floor about how his colleagues tended to be slow at getting incarcerated men to the visiting area. Around 11 p.m., he was approached by a group of 3000 boys in the stairwell outside the banquet hall who asked him why he was disrespecting them. Now that these guys were full of liquid courage, these fools were actually pushing up on another deputy and trying to get their ride on. Deputy Lazario Perez saw the argument and tried to intervene but became caught up in the confrontation himself. Both Perez and Vasquez were punched repeatedly by deputies Alfonso Andrade, Hernan Delgado, Joseph Gonzalez, Christopher Hernandez, Juan Navarro, Jeffrey Rivera, Mauricio Rodriguez, and Jason Snyder. Over 200, people, over 200 people witnessed the brawl, including Captain Daniel Cruz, who ran the Men's Central Jail at that time. Several photographs taken that night showed the 3,000 boys flashing their gang signs before the fight. Deputy Susi Ayala, who also worked in visitation, confronted some of the deputies attacking Perez and Vasquez. Andrade punched her in the face. <laughs> Several Montebello Police Department MPD officers reported to the Quiet Cannon in response to a 911 call and were told that their help wasn't needed. The MPD officers left without any further investigation. An Internal Affairs Bureau investigation into the brawl resulted in the firing of only six deputies. It's unclear if there was an appeals process which could have resulted in the reinstatement of these deputies. Vasquez and Perez filed federal civil rights suits alleging that LASD was inadequate with disciplining deputies. Jason Snyder, one of the 3,000 boys, brought another civil rights suit against Paul Tanaka alleging retaliation. Both cases were settled. They did not reduce the power and influence of the growing gang. The 3,000 boys remained intact and continued to terrorize Men's Central Jail. Unfortunately for the department, Secret deputy cliques within the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department have been a problem for the LASD since at least the late 1980s, some say before. Such affinity groups hit the public's consciousness way before the revelation of the 3000 boys, but these guys brought a lot of attention on themselves by wreaking havoc on the department's already troubled notorious Men's Central Jail. Because of the attention they brought on themselves, the highest profile CJ clique is definitely the 3000 boys, 
with their matching tattoos and their well-established cryptic hand signals. But there are also the 2000 boys, among others, both inside the jails and outside on the street. Now, according to some rumors that were substantiated by a story that was put out by the LA Times, the department is now worried by a clique inside the LASD gang unit, reportedly because of what is printed in a memo or pamphlet that may indicate that deputies' participation in officer-involved shootings conveys status within the clique. Rumors of shootings conveying within other LASD cliques have long swirled around the department. However, if such a delineation really does appear in writing, it would be an entirely different matter. Los Angeles County Sheriff's detectives have launched a probe into what appears to be a secret deputy clique within the department's elite gang unit. An investigation triggered by the discovery of a document suggesting the group embraces shootings as a badge of honor. The document described a code of conduct for the jump out boys, a clique of hard charging aggressive deputies who gain more respect after being in a shooting according to sources with knowledge of the investigation. The pamphlet is relatively short and explains that deputies earn admission into the group through the endorsement of members. The source stressed that the internal affairs investigation is still in early stages and that little is known about the Jump Out Boys behavior or its membership. Some people who are familiar with the Jump Out Boys say that they acquired their name after being famous for jumping out on inmates after they first enter the jail. They jump out, there's a vicious beatdown until the inmates are often left unconscious or are beaten within minutes of losing their lives and then they cover it up by claiming that they were assaulted by the inmates. <laughs> Dirty motherfuckers, man. Still, sheriff's officials are concerned that the group represents another unsanctioned clique within the department's ranks, a problem the department has been grappling with for decades. Sources close to the department express concerns about whether the department's investigation into the clique would be honest and aggressive due to Sheriff Baca having influence within the IAB, Internal Affairs Bureau, and the investigative unit tasked with conducting the probe. In the case of the 3,000 boys and the matching group from the second floor, the 2,000 boys, the cliques had recently started waiting for their entire crew to get off work, sometimes lingering for hours at a time, before leaving the station together in mass. This was not only a violation of departmental policy, but it was eerie gang-like behavior intended to intimidate to show both inmates and supervisors alike who really ran the jail. Officially, Sheriff Baca disapproves of groups like the Jump Out Boys, the 3000 Boys, the 2000 Boys, the Regulators and the Vikings, et al. But sources inside the LASD say that unofficially a double message is conveyed to the troops with the undersheriff's well-documented work in the gray speeches and his tendency to protect, rescue and reward those who do color outside the lines. And of course, his retention of the Viking ink on his ankle. While Baca concedes that the group engages in gang-like activity, he refuses to designate the group itself as a gang. This may have something to do with the fact that this little knot of miscreants is composed of LA County Sheriff deputies employed at the Men's Central Jail. Even in spite of the fact that inmates have complained about horrific conditions in the 3000 block of the Men's Central Jail, Baca continues to turn a blind eye to it. The protests were consistently dismissed as an ACLU grievance, mongering until the 3,000 boys made that critical mistake of assaulting fellow officers on Christmas that night at the banquet party. That night would ultimately become their own undoing. The police cohere in ultra-violent cliques and behave like droogs from a clockwork orange. The custodians of acceptable opinion liberally apply to one of their own favorite semantic cosmetics, the term rogue. Thus, the 3,000 boys are habitually described as a group of rogue Los Angeles Sheriff's deputies despite the fact that the only unforgivable rogue behavior appears to be inflicting injury on a fellow officer. Furthermore, membership in a police gang of this type is a time-honored tradition in Los Angeles. Witness the fact that Paul Tanaka, the former Los Angeles Assistant Sheriff, is a veteran of the notorious Linwood Vikings police gang. Tanaka was inked in or tattooed as a member of the Vikings while he was a young deputy in 1987, a year before he was named in a wrongful death lawsuit stemming from the shooting of a young Korean man. The department eventually settled for close to $1 million. 
At the police station in Linwood, the Vikings were notorious for playing adolescent pranks such as shooting a dog and tying his carcass to the commander's squad car or decorating various surfaces with human feces. They displayed a similarly playful touch in dealing out unwarranted violence toward local residents. In 1989, Captain Burke Weva, a no-nonsense commander with the executive disposition of Dirty Harry, was sent to Linwood to clean out the gang infestation. When Cueva started to transfer Vikings to other precincts, these tat-wearing badass veterans of the street wars responded in a fashion worthy of bespectacled briefcase-toting pencil necks they so hardly despised. They filed a discrimination lawsuit which led to an out-of-court settlement in Cueva's inglorious retirement in 1992. Four years later, tax victims in Los Angeles were forced to underwrite a $9 million settlement arising out of a civil claims filed by victims of Viking-related violence. By that time, the perpetrators had been dispersed throughout the LAPD and the LA Sheriff's Office, where many, Tanaka most prominently, had leadership positions. This would certainly explain the culture of lawlessness described in the Quiet Cannon lawsuit. You keep your mouth shut and obey the code of silence, explained former Los Angeles Deputy Mike Osborne, who had been invited to join the secretive Viking Society in 1999. Any illegal acts you witness by other deputies, you don't say anything. If you're asked, you say, I didn't see nothing. Osborne and his wife, who was also a deputy, retired in 1996. Miss Osborne violated that code by accusing her training officer, Jeffrey Jones, of evidence tampering. At about the same time, Jones, who eventually pleaded no contest to felony charges, was arraigned. The Osbournes and their two children were terrorized by a drive-by shooting at their home. Quasi-official street gangs can be found embedded in any major metropolitan police departments, often making their presence known to the public through episodes of severe off-duty violence. Such was the case with the near-fatal beating of Milwaukee resident Frank Jude Jr. in October of 2004. Jude, a male dancer hired to perform at a bachelorette party, was set upon by a thug scrum of off-duty officers who accused him of stealing a badge. Jude was thrown to the ground, beaten, kicked and choked. A knife was put to his throat and a pin jammed to one of his ears. The near fatal beating inflicted permanent brain damage. None of the relevant facts were in dispute, but the jury accepted the claim that the beating was an effort to subdue a resisting suspect with a criminal history. <laughs> Cold shit, man. Jude wasn't charged in connection with the incident. Former Milwaukee police officer John Bartlett, the ringleader of the gang beating, was eventually convicted, along with six others, on federal civil rights charges. An internal affairs investigation revealed that Bartlett and other officers who assaulted Jude belonged to a tattoo street gang calling itself the Punishers, described by MPD Commander James A. Galazuski, a group of rogue officers. There's that sanitizing adjective again. Who would I characterize as brutal and abusive? The gang-like group, don't you dare call it a gang. Borrowed its name and its logo, its stylized skull, from a nihilistic comic book vigilante. By the time he was convicted on federal charges stemming from the attempted homicide of Frank Jude, John Bartlett, who had been long known to be a troubled officer, was serving a prison sentence for calling in a bomb threat to his former police station. <laughs> That's how you do it. Galazuski offered a detailed description of the Punishers in official reports filed on two separate investigations, one in 2005, the other in 2007. He also described his findings at length in a sworn deposition in November 2010. One training supervisor and at least one active duty police officer have been identified as current members of the gang. Nevertheless, last January, MPD Edward Flynn stated that the existence of the gang was merely as a matter of rumor, which in light of the evidence collected by his own department could be construed as Flynn's attempt to obey the code of silence, referred to by Mike Osborne. And that's definitely what it is. Flynn seems to be too dumb for his own good. The problems that have been plaguing MCJ have already been plastered all over every local news station in Los Angeles County. And the ensuing investigations have been a central topic amongst the jail's administration. 
So for Flynn to deny any knowledge about it, even from an investigative standpoint, is just a blatant illustration that Flynn's all about enforcing the code of silence. Three months after the six officers were fired behind the Quiet Cannon incident, both the LA County Board of Supervisors and the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department initiated investigations into the jail's abuse scandal. Yet, despite the commotion, the highest ranking member of the department to be put on leave in relationship to the scandal was former Men's Central Jail Commanding Officer Captain Dan Cruz. Cruz definitely deserves a share of the blame for violence inside the jail. Cruz was openly too buddy-buddy with the deputies under his command, which allowed an already problematic culture of gang-like deputy cliques to flourish inside the jail with little or no accountability for abusive actions. In addition, Cruz was one of two captains present when the now infamous fight between deputies broke out at the Christmas party in Montebello. When Montebello police got the call that there was a fight at the Quiet Cannon and went to investigate, it was Cruz who told Montebello cops that it was a code four kick rocks, what's going on here is none of your business, and that the sheriffs would handle it. But it was a big deal. The deputies were beaten by their breathing, returned two days later to press criminal charges. That kind of let boys be boys mentality to correct out of control deputies is in keeping with what was Cruz's administrative style inside Men's Central Jail. But despite the undeniable problems inside Men's Central Jail under Cruz's watch, blame for the violence in the jails lies much higher up in the food chain than Dan Cruz. The story of how Dan Cruz came to run Men's Central Jail is nearly as disquieting as the incidents of abuse that took place under his watch. The jail's previous captain, John Clark, had been shipped out of MCJ for attempting to contain the spread of street gang-like cliques of deputies inside the jail with names like the 3000 Boys. Clark proposed a corrective called the shift rotation, which would have required deputies to be assigned to multiple sections of the jail instead of simply staying put on the same floor, thus breaking up the cliques. That effort at reform, however, was stopped by then Dirty Under Sheriff Paul Tanaka, who was already the most powerful figure in the department aside from the sheriff himself and whose influence was felt on most of the LASD's day-to-day -day operations. After fielding calls and emails from second and third floor deputies who didn't want to be rotated away from their clique members, Tanaka overruled his captain's reform attempts and transferred Clark out of custody altogether. To replace Clark, Tanaka brought in Bob Olmstead. Sheriff Baca has said recently that Olmstead was brought in to oversee the renovation of the jail's aging interior, which had been criticized by the ACLU and others as being Dickensian and dangerous. Although the problems plaguing Men's Central Jail, including deputy on inmate violence, did not magically vanish overnight under the new captain, Olmstead's efforts did begin to pay measurable dividends. In both 2007 and 2008, force numbers dropped inside county jail, especially on the troubles in second and third floors. Olmstead also expected the officers under him to follow department rules. In 2007, Olmstead was able to get rid of a problem deputy who was reputed to be a 3,000 boy ringleader. While on disciplinary leave, the 3,000 boy was involved in a domestic dispute with his girlfriend. That wasn't enough to warrant dismissal from the force. But in the police report from the incident, the deputy's girlfriend claimed he was a steroid abuser. Olmstead had the deputy tested for steroids and his positive test forced the department's hand in removing him from duty. Still, Tanaka was pleased enough with Olmstead that in April of 2008, Olmstead was promoted to custody commander with oversight over CJ, Twin Towers and Century Regional Detention Facility. To replace Olmstead, Paul Tanaka then promoted and installed CJ Operations Lieutenant Daniel Cruz as the next captain of Men's Central Jail. Problems sprang up almost immediately under Cruz's watch. Just like at Lennox, forced packages and complaints began to pile up. A second lieutenant, Mark McCorkle, analyzed them. For example, in one such incident from 2009, an inmate was passing an officer on the fifth floor, sucked his teeth as he went by. Sucking teeth, a gesture involving loudly cleaning one's upper front teeth with a sucking motion of the tongue, is considered disrespectful inside the jail walls. 
The officer in question took the inmate aside, put him on the wall, and told him he was being disrespectful. When the inmate argued, the deputy took him to the ground and beat him badly. Olmstead said he took McCorkle's finding up the chain of command to custody chief Dennis Burns and assistant sheriff in charge custody Marvin McCavanaugh and to Paul Tanaka. No action was taken. There was no accountability and there's been no accountability. Cruz's oversight of CJ was lax and incompetent enough that Olmstead planned on giving him a failing performance review, which is almost unheard of for a supervisor ranked as high as a captain in the department. The lack of accountability eventually led to more scrutiny and in the end, an internal affairs investigation that was directed at Tanaka. And when you undergo this type of IA investigation, they go through everything. But Tanaka wouldn't hear any of it. Tanaka's worst run-in with IA in the 1980s is well known. In 1988, he was the senior officer on the scene when five sheriff's deputies shot and killed an unarmed Korean immigrant named Hong Pio Lee after a car chase found Lee cornered at a dead-end street. The group of deputies filed 15 rounds at 21-year-old Lee, hitting him nine times in the back and neck. Tanaka and the other four deputies claimed they shot Lee because he was attempting to hit them with his car. However, Long Beach officer Richard R. Boltwright, who witnessed the shooting, said in a sworn deposition that Lee's car was moving away from the deputies when the shooting began. We just observed the sheriffs execute somebody, Boltwright said, he told his partner. LA County paid Lee's family $1 short of $1 million in a settlement after the shooting. Then in 1993, Tanaka was reportedly shipped to West Hollywood Station as a disciplinary measure for using harsh and inappropriate language to berate a female deputy at Century Station where Tanaka was a lieutenant. He's been carrying a grudge around for more than 20 years. That should not be the position for any department head and certainly not the man leading the department's two internal investigative units. The encounter with the internal affairs sergeant Larry Landreth is one of a number of occasions in which Tanaka reportedly badmouthed IA in front of other department personnel. In 2005, Tanaka called a deputies only meeting at Century Station in Inglewood, which was, at the time, struggling with violence stemming from a deputy gang called the Regulators, who, like the better known deputy gang of the 1980s to 1990s era, the Vikings, were notorious for finding weak supervisors they could gang up on and control. Tanaka's message to this troublesome group, I never liked IA, never liked the way they do business. Apparently, the feeling was mutual and was mirrored by not only the Los Angeles County Internal Affairs Unit, but also by the Federal Bureau of Investigation as well. Unbeknownst to both Sheriff Lee Baca and Under Sheriff Paul Tanaka, the FBI launched an undercover probe on the Men's Central Jail in 2011 to investigate wide-ranging allegations into corruption and abuse. The U.S. Department of Justice Civil Rights Division also launched a wide-scale pattern and practice investigation into allegations that Antelope Valley deputies discriminated against minority residents who received government housing assistance. During Tanaka's tenure as undersheriff, the American Civil Liberties Union filed a federal class action lawsuit against Sheriff Lee Baca and top commanders, including Tanaka, for perpetrating a long-standing widespread pattern of violence against inmates in the county jails. In September 2012, the Citizens Commission on Jail Violence issued a final report that is very critical to the Sheriff's Department's management, including Baca, Tanaka, and other executive level staff, accusing them of fostering a culture in which deputies beat and humiliated inmates, covered up misconduct, and formed aggressive deputy cliques in the county jails. Tanaka was in charge of the department's patrol division and its budget. The report also called for the removal of Tanaka from the chain of command supervising the jail system for statements that Tanaka had delivered, indicating that deputies could use excessive force against prisoners and that aggressive behavior would not result in discipline. The report also noted that Tanaka had accepted campaign contributions from many department employees, furthering perceptions of patronage and favoritism in promotion and assignment decisions. On March 6, 2013, Tanaka announced that he would retire as the undersheriff effective August 1, 2013, 
during an ongoing federal probe conducted by the FBI into widespread allegations of abuse, misconduct, and mismanagement in county jails. Although his decision to resign was portrayed as being under his own volition, Baca told Tanaka to step down because Tanaka had become a political liability. But Tanaka and Baca were undoubtedly wallowing in a cesspool of corruption much worse than anyone could have anticipated. Once rumors began to swirl about the possibility of a federal probe that was being conducted on both Tanaka and Baca, they then took steps in an effort to try to thwart the investigation and throw investigators off. The plot to derail the federal investigation of the LASD supposedly began in August of 2011 when sheriff deputies retrieved a mobile phone from an inmate at Men's Central Jail and were able to connect the phone to the FBI. Discovering that the inmate turned FBI informant was Anthony Brown, deputies had purposely hidden Brown from his FBI handlers by moving him around different jails and changing Brown's name. They were literally playing musical chairs with this guy and deliberately tried obstructing the investigation by not giving the FBI access at interviewing him. This was a blatant act to frustrate the FBI and to curtail any contact with the informant. It got so bad that the FBI began to worry about the possibility of Brown's life being in imminent danger and these two departments actually almost came to physical blows over this game that was being played. But the feds had seen enough and were done playing. On May 13, 2015, Tanaka was indicted on federal conspiracy and obstruction charges in the ongoing Los Angeles County Men's Jail Corruptions investigation. Tanaka was the 8th LASD official to be criminally charged based on actions taken in the summer of 2011. On April 6, 2016, Tanaka was convicted on conspiracy and obstruction of justice charges by a federal jury in a case presided over by U.S. District Judge Percy Anderson. The charges centered on allegations that in 2011, Tanaka orchestrated a scheme to derail the FBI's jail investigation by intimidating the lead agent in the case, pressuring deputies not to cooperate and concealing the whereabouts of an inmate who was working as a federal informant. As a result, Councilman Mark E. Henderson was appointed Mayor Pro Tem and served as acting mayor of Gardena until the March 2017 election. On June 27, 2016, Tanaka was sentenced to five years in prison for civil rights abuses inside the nation's largest urban jail system. He was also sentenced to serve two years of supervised release after he was discharged from prison and to pay a $7,500 fine. He faced a maximum of 15 years in federal prison. Tanaka planned to file a motion to sidestep his August 1st jail surrender deadline and remain out on bail while he appealed his conviction. He surrendered January 16, 2017 to federal authorities in Colorado to begin serving the prison sentence at a minimum security camp in Inglewood, Colorado. Some of the officers involved in this corruption investigation were fired and prosecuted for their roles in this scandal. On May 12, 2017, former Sheriff Lee Baca was also convicted and sentenced to serve three years in federal prison for his role to obstruct the FBI investigation, abuses in the county jails, and the same corruption scandal that his undersheriff Paul Tanaka was convicted on. I hope you guys have enjoyed this episode of Paradigm Profiles. We should be dropping our next project this next week. And as always, we want to thank you guys for supporting the channel.